Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abdullahi Osman. I'm the former chair of the Technical Selection Committee, which vetted and collected the names of the current parliament in 2012. Today, we are here because Somalia faces yet another self-imposed political deadline. The mandate and term of the current federal government institutions are scheduled to come to an end in August 2016. Unfortunately, for the past three years, key national institutions, especially those that were designed to facilitate one man, one vote, were not established. And, other failed, and others failed to perform their duties, including security and livelihood in the country. This is a result of constitutional and administrative quagmire of unfulfilled political mandates and failure to meet the constitutionally mandated benchmarks, as well as basic needs of the Somali citizen. Today, the country needs to have urgent national debate on the constitutional and legislative options and models of change for political transition in 2016. We, gourmet members of the Somali diaspora in the Canadian and the United States, are determined to play a constructive role, engage the key holders, and inform the process towards lasting political reconciliation in Somalia. The purpose of our press conference today is to present a statement of principles we believe embody a framework for a path to a sound constitutional and legal transition come 2016 in Somalia. Therefore, we strongly under, un, underscore the importance of protecting the sovereignty, independence, national unity, and the ter uh, territorial integrity of Somalia. We affirm the central role of the, role of the Somali citizen is running the affairs of their country and note that genuine political reconciliation is the key to a durable peace and stability in Somalia. In order to ensure broad political ownership of the political roadmap and transition in 2016, and to prevent the absolute control and monopoly of the political decision-making processes in 2016 by a few greedy Somali political figures and foreign actors, we emphasize the need for preserving the institutions of the parliament, which is it, uh, uh, with its all fundamental flaws and shortcomings notwithstanding, remains the only supposedly representative political institution in post-Civil War Somalia. Given the near impossibility of establishing an electoral system based on one person, one vote, or a popular referendum before August 2016 in Somalia, we view the institution of the parliament as the only remaining viable source of political legitimacy responsible for developing models of change for political transition in 2016 in Somalia. We urge the recently appointed Independent Review and Implementation Commission to immediately start in coordination with the Parliament Oversight Committee, the Constitutional Review, and propose key amendments to the Constitution that could be translated into action before August 2016. These amendments and proposals must provide the framework 
for transition to 2016 and override contradictory and transitional provision in the current constitutional and legislative framework. We remind the Somali political leaders that time is of essence. Therefore, they must take key steps needed to complete immediately the parliament uh, to complete uh, to be completed by the parliament and the government before August 2016 including but not limited the establishment of the constitutionally mandated commissions including uh, the establishment of the constitutional court the appointment of the members of the Judicial Service Committee, the appointment of members of the National Independent Electoral Commission, which in turn will establish uh, the rules and the regulation of the uh, of elections, including the creation of and registration of pa uh, uh, political parties, the establishment of the Anti-Corruption Commission, the appointment of members of the Boundaries and Federal Commission, the establishment of the Inter-State Commission, the establishment of Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the establishment of Human Rights Commission. We believe that failure to establish these institutions in a timely fashion not only constitution, uh, constitutes blatant violation of the Constitution, but it also perpetuates the lack of institutionalization of the Somali political system, thereby allowing foreign actors to manage the Somali political affairs through the so-called negotiated measures rather than established legal processes. Finally, the government of the United States invested so much of its taxpayers' money in supporting the security and the political reconciliation in Somalia. It owes the American people the duty to ensure that such investments bear fruit. Um, I'm going to stop my, uh, my, my press formal press release and we're going to open the floor for questions. And I would like also at this moment to invite my colleague, uh, a former envoy of Somalia in Washington, D.C., Mr. Avokar Arman. Please welcome to, to do the questions with us. If you have any comments, please. Uh, just quickly, a couple of words before we go into the Q&A. Uh, I just wanted to expand and, and give you a little background of the statement that you just heard. It's the outcome of a meeting that took place on uh, March 21st and 22nd, this past March. Uh, a group of, uh, that called itself Gurmat, Gurmat 2020, uh, have met in uh, Minneapolis and thoroughly discussed uh, the situation in Somalia. And from every aspect of the condition that we are in, as you're all aware, and many of you in the media are very familiar with the, with the situation in there and have some interest in there, of course the protracted civil war has created a situation of distrust and division between people. And it also created uh, chronic dependency, not only in terms of uh, uh, in the economic sense, uh, but the, in the political sense and the intellectual sense. So the Somalis in general, as people, we ended up just waiting for others to come and solve our problems. And that's what Professor Hiri was talking about in the end. It goes right back to the same uh, characters mostly domestic who became through, uh, corrupted through that process, and others who took advantage of that. And the, uh, the solutions that are given not necessarily remedy the condition that the people are in. So to rise above that, some Somalis from different sector of the society got together and ultimately wanted to kind of develop our own strategy, our own grand strategy which would be based in the principles that was just articulated by Professor Healy. And establishing those commissions would be the, the key component of that strategy, basically. And it will enable us, as Somalis, to take charge of our conditions, 
to create situations and, and to, to uh, pave the way for our future. And that's what the key uh, uh, intention of that uh, meeting was. With that, I'll just uh, go straight to the question and answers, and then we'll expand it as we progress. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Abdullahi uh, Hirey and uh, Ambassador Arman. Uh, uh, professor, when he was articulating the, uh, the, uh, the vision, uh, there was uh, many times that he mentioned uh, the 2016. And the ambassador, when he was talking, he said about uh, something, Vision 2020. So what are, we, what are these discrepancies between the Vision 2020 2016. Very good point. You want to address yeah. that? Or? Yeah. Um, first of all, um, when 2012, uh, the and I would like to give you a little bit of a background, when the, 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 the current parliament has been established, uh, I, was, uh, I was chairing the, the TSC, the Technical Selection Committee, and the mandate to establish uh, the, the, the commission was signed by the president in June, I think June 22nd, uh, and the, of which August 20th was the deadline to create uh, a parliament. Uh, it was actually it's inhumanly impossible, and at the end of the day, we've ended up with a parliament with 275, which was actually characteristics, characteristics of going back since the uh, first Djibouti conference up until now, well, the Somalis have a parliament, you know, hit their back, let them have a government. Uh, then one of the things that then the, the current government was, was, was mandated was to create an environment viable or that can create one man, one vote, uh, which was to establish the commissions, to complete the, the structure of the government, uh, be it independent court system, uh, the nine ma uh, constitutionally mandated uh, 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 commissions, none of which has been established as we speak. Uh, August being less, I mean, a little bit over a year, uh, and by the way, as characteristics in Somalia, by January, everybody will be chasing everyone else. That's it, we are in the, in the, in the election mode, uh, meaning that we do have between now and the end of the year, if anything can happen. So, um, then Vision 2016 is based on what was mandated for this government to do it, which, is, which so far it has failed. Vision 2020, I think, maybe is the, 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 the distant cousin of Vision 2020, Vision 2016, that maybe it's not realistic to hold a 2016 b based on the lack of what, was not, what has not been done. Hence, uh, maybe 2020, 2020 might be the, 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 I think that's what I'm understanding. But uh, uh, my brother, Abuker, Ambassador Abuker, can elaborate more. Yes, and I, I think all of that is uh, true, but it also uh, insinuates, because we're talking about strategy, and we have to really think beyond the moments of contention. I mean, election time is normally the time when everybody's running, and, and the business of politics is a zero-sum game. Uh, no two political party win at the same time. In most cases, you, you will have one president or one uh, prime minister representing one side or another. We're not interested in that. We're not a political party that's really opposing one group or another. We're, we have a vision for a nation. And, and our thinking is long term. Our thinking is not just 2016 and who's going to run for for this group or that group. That one we have ample people on the ground and we will have some more, of course. So the 2020 is more or less when you're thinking about grand strategy, that big picture. We, we're hopefully those who can see much clearer and in this sense, metaphorically standing on top of hill and kind of viewing the whole thing from a little bit above that are not as part of the uh, brawl, if you will, the political brawl that's taking place. So I hope that answers your question, but it's not just uh, that period because Vision 2016 was intended to, ultimate goal was to have a, a one person, one vote. Is that possible? Realistically speaking, the simple answer is, and I'll go on record saying this, the answer is no, it's not really possible, realistically speaking. We can do something symbolic that really just uh, 
one particular area conducts a vote and ultimately people like, elect. Like 2012. Like 2012. Right, <laughs> exactly. And you don't want to go that route. You want to be thinking, don't operate with the mentality of deadlines, operate with mentality of a strategy. And that's our ultimate goal, is to think beyond, you know, the time is ticking, let's go ahead and make a decision, which has been our story. We have a long history of that. And that's not how we want to react. We don't want to react because it's time. You know, move on, move on. You know, the term is over. You know, uh, because all of these mandates, all of these deadlines, were something imposed on the people. It was not because Somalis negotiated these deadlines. They didn't. So that is what we want to do: think beyond that, basically. After opening, now we process has always been one of negotiation. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like there's no capable institutions to uphold uh, the process in Somalia. So as a result, then there's a lot of uh, other foreign actors that uh, goes into the process and starts to uh, be the shepherd for the Somali process. So this group is looking to have an ownership in the process, the Somali people, advocating for the Somali people to have ownership in the process. Who do you see will be the ally or your ally to help you with that? Because if there is no capable institutions in Somalia, and if this other uh, international community is shepherding the process, then how do you counteract that? What's your strategy of counteracting that? And who do you think that would be, uh, who's going to be your ally in helping you with, with, with your ambition? Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me take a shot at it. And uh, what we are currently, for two reasons that we would not really go into in in depth uh, details of uh, of what that strategy would be so after all we're not the ones that are out there who are going to run i'm not running for anything and i know that uh, professor Hillary is not running for anything right now the goal is to have some strategy and when you're talking about strategy you look you kind of survey uh, the the landscape the political landscape of the country right now there are a lot of people who are, many of them who are friends of Somalia, and many of them who are not friends of Somalia. At the end of the day, politics is about interests, right? Every country has its own interests that it has to advance. I think it was a Harry Truman, uh, President Harry Truman, who said before that in politics, nothing happens by accident. You know, if you think things happen by accident, it's you who don't have any clue, because everything is by design, in other words. If you did not plan for it, somebody else planned for that. So the, the foreign elements, they're there for their own interest. Now, some would get it through by coming through the right door and introducing themselves and making their points clear. Others will climb through the window, others through other means. You know. So, And all of these characters are present. So who would be your friend? The friends that would be and the friends who would be your, uh, the people who would be your friends are the ones that have proven to be your friend. And there are many of them. And U.S. is one of them, you know. Uh, Turkey is another. And I mean, there are a lot of I mean, uh, countries that have really proven on the, on the ground that they have well intentioned. And I'm just mentioning two, not, not to say that others are not doing. That's not the intention, but the intention is if I list all of them, I will end up leaving one or two and offend other people. So these are just examples, okay? Now, the same way that who are your friends within the Somali uh, context, you know, who are your friends? Is everybody who happens to be Somali going to be on the same side to advance this project? Of course not. The same way, then, why would you expect every foreign element that's there to be on your side and be cheering with this kind of outcome? They're not. So you select wisely who would be able to assist you in this when you need them. But the initial stage, we have to be sovereign enough to take our issue on our own and to advance our issues, regardless of what others are saying, regardless of all of these artificial <coughs> agreements, if you will, in the past, who, you know, we, we know what, what was the result and how they came about. 
and we know that it's not getting us anywhere because right now you have individuals who are representing little fiefdoms and each one of them dressed the same, each one is called president and each one thinks that he controls some area and he does not. And we know that. And all of them are he, by the way. Thanks. Uh, just to add a little bit, uh, you have said something about negotiations that have built this. I think, I, I beg to differ, there was no negotiation. There was a domination by those who were the warlords and, and later on the religious overlords who were able to go to either Djibouti or Kenya or Ethiopia who were there as a result of domination and force and their host, the, the so-called international community, who did not have the ability, the unwillingness or maybe the inability to go to the, to the, to the ground and talk to, you know, to the Somali people who are looking for livelihood and, uh, and, 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 and stability. Uh, then my, 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 the, what I would like to add is that who is our ally actually is the Somali people. After all, what, why, you know, um, every now and then I just sit down and say, to hell with, with Somalia, I'm tired of 30 years, you know, nearly 30 years of, of, of nothing but trouble. But then again, in the middle of the night, I wake up and talk about my auntie who is who's somewhere else and my, my cousin is my, you know, it is something that will never leave, you know, in, in our psyche. So we may as well then put a genuine effort to mobilize, to educate, to uh, uh, give a voice to the voiceless among the Somali people, which is what, what we call the Loma or Loma Ara and Loma Oye. Uh, and all of, the, all of us are Loma Ara and Loma Oye because we are one way or another hostage. Even if the warlord is your cousin, he's your biggest enemy that you do have. After all, he takes away your money, he kills your son and, you, uh, you know, and in, a, in, a, in a mindless wars that, that are going on. Not to mention all the other uh, atrocities that they are causing to the other people. So in this sense then, w what we do need is, is to, to, to talk to the, our Somali brothers and sisters to say, look, what we are going is, is wrong. I mean, uh, 2016 is not aged on stone. It's someone decided it. Unfortunately, the government that had been there three years had not done what it was supposed to do. But then again, should we go to the route of 2012 ad hoc, quick, and then come back to the same you know, uh, uh, result? Craziness is, after all, doing the same thing and expecting uh, a different outcome. So we would like to open, you know, uh, what do you call it, think outside of the box, even even it can be 2018, 2020, 2025, even 2030. But so long as we are, we have decided to take a route and follow it. Yeah. My name is Abdul, Abdul Abdul. I would like to ask you a question about uh, uh, the press release. Uh, talks about things that uh, the politicians need actually a reminder that you're sending it to the politicians to uh, complete key steps, which is establishing the mandates of the constitutional mandates, which is long overdue. Uh, this, uh, the constitution, uh, when the constitution was passed in 2012 and the parliament was formed, mm -hmm. It's well, almost now three years. This August will be three years, and no major uh, well, accomplishment has been achieved so far. And also in the uh, in the same token, you are uh, suggesting also the preserving of uh, the institutions, such as the parliament. Uh, so, wh what is your hope? Uh, are you of that the parliament uh, that will they will do something before the 2016? And uh, why? What is what is the uh, this message that the preserving? Uh, can you please elaborate with that message? What, what it means as far as uh, what the, you know, the term ends uh, of the 
the government, and the president, and the parliament all will cease to function as we know, August of 2016. So what does that message that you're sending uh, means uh, to us? Yeah, and, uh, okay. well, let me just, and uh, in the interest of getting everybody on the same page, the mindset that we are operating on, and it is the factual one, is the fact that once we reach uh, August 2016, not only the term of the government ends, but technically, even the provisional constitution ends. Technically, everything, every legal entity, every legal institution that we right now have comes to an end. Now, that definitely creates a vacuum. And in most cases, what was happening is throughout uh, post-Civil War history that we were on each other's throat as Somalis <laughs> until these terms end. And then there was always that goodwill, good Samaritan uh, foreign element that came and just put something on the table and said, here's how you guys are going to operate. And then you always had few people who were willingly signing for whatever incentive they get out of that or another. We, we don't want to go that route. So the mindset that we're operating is we have to preserve the key institutions, at least in, you know, focusing in this case, I, I think Professor Hire mentioned, uh, thinking of the parliament, for example. Why the parliament, despite all of these uh, negative baggage that they have, because uh, definitely we know there's a great deal of corruption in there, there's a great deal of tr clanism mentality in there, and so forth. But there are a lot of good people in there. And that institution has more experience, if you will, than any of these others. You, know, you cannot make the same argument for the presidency, because you ultimately want to have a legitimate process whereby the president is elected. So. From that perspective, we're giving the benefit of the doubt to this one institution, to, uh, you know, settling for the lesser of the few evil, I guess, in this case, for lack of better description. So once you have that entity, at least for how long is it going to be? Is it going to be indefinite? No, we haven't discussed all of that. But that is part of this strategy, and that is what we intend to. There is an upcoming meeting that we're going to be meeting in Columbus, Ohio. The main discussion that would take course would be this particular issue. And we understand that it is going to be controversial. We understand that. But again, we're operating with the mindset that we're not really doing this thing for self-interest. So we would at least have some kind of somewhat a moral authority to say, guys, we're just setting up the rules, the ground rules for you. You can compete politically. If you have a political party, a, B, C, D, go ahead and be part of that competition. But we have to have a legal mechanism to do that. If we don't do that, what would be the alternative? The alternative is the landscape that I mentioned earlier. And some of you already know this thing in details. You already have individuals who are operating with the mindset of president, you know, that they control this geographical area or that geographical area. They're all called presidents. And each one would end up selecting some particular group, whatever temporary individuals for electing the next president or what have you. And that's the game plan. And that literally advances the interest of some, especially foreign elements, that really went to keep Somali in the condition that it is, or perhaps even worse, because it, they directly benefit from that. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add. Uh, Parliaments inherently are, are incapable of doing a lot of things. Parliaments are <coughs> not designed to be efficient. Parliaments are designed to be a pluralistic representation of the society. And as the word says, absolute power absolutely corrupts is when you come to the executive side of the political spectrum whereby you do have one person who is capable of giving order and another person expected to follow that. More damage than can be done from the executive 
uh, than from the parliament because the parliaments are 500, what, 275 guys who are of equal <coughs> statute. Nobody is supposed to respect and, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, everybody is, is independent from everyone else. From that perspective, if we have to choose the lesser of the two evil, yes, they are incapable. They are uh, corrupt, like, like, like my brother said. They have a lot of issues that they do have. However, given the alternative of leaving this person, I mean, what do you call the executive branch in there, which so far has failed miserably to do what it was supposed to do. Hence, th to have at least some kind of a plurality and some kind of a 275 people who at least can come up with something. They do have good people. They do have people who deserve to be chased out. So in that sense, then, you know, uh, having them preserved for now, at least until we come up with a viable alternative. And, I'm, and if I understand our, our message is that this is a beginning. A, a, a beginning to sit down and say, hey, what is good for us down the line? It's 2016, 2018, 2020. How do we move? What, what do we do? And, I, and I, this is actually an opening of a dialogue rather than, uh, you know, we do have this 2020, August uh, 12, we are going to have an uh, election. It's not the case. Even 2020 is just a vision. And vision means, and the current vision 2016 actually is, can see only one eye is already dead, and the other one you can only see a few, you know, trinkles here and there. So it is an opening rather than an end. Thank you, Professor Abdullahi. And thank you, Abukar. I have one question. With that question is, can you just explain to one of you how this government start? And what is the, you know, just the... So I'm going to repeat. Thank you, Abukar, and thank you, Abdullahi. I wanted just to know what motivated you to start this government. Mm. Well, I think you are, <laughs> he's more capable of answering that. Well, well, the motivation, I guess, it's very clear uh, because of where we are. I mean, uh, look at how humiliated we are throughout the world. I mean, our case has become a pitiful case. Uh, I started my opening remarks that included we became chronically dependent intellectually, politically, economically. This is precisely what I meant. You know, gone are the days when you have Somalis who are getting get together and really agree to one particular model that they want to really apply it on their uh, on their people, and and without really having a self self interest, and saying that I will be the head of that particular game or that particular movement or what have you. We don't have to be that. We just want to set the stage for a model that could be used as the engine for the future of solving our own problems. We recognize that the biggest problem that happened between us as Somalis is injustice, regardless of what people call it. You know, some people call it, we are, I from Clan A, this was done to me, blah, 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 blah. He's focusing this, you know, that kind of vision on an issue that's much broader than that, than that one clan. The, at the end of the day, the issue is injustice. So if we call it injustice, then you would have everybody find an interest in there. Listen to this. Let me underscore that point. If we recognize our problem is injustice, then everybody can be included in the discussion because all of us have interest in having a just society, for example. Then we can lay out what are, how do we recognize that the system is more just for you and for me and for everybody else, whether they're complaining or not, because not everybody is vociferous about what happened to them. Let's be honest about it. There are a lot of people who suffered throughout who did not or do not in many ways in, uh, claim that they've been, there were wrongs done unto them. So when we address the injustice, we're speaking for that silent person as well. Not just the vociferous one that says, we're going beyond that mentality. Okay? So once we recognize that, then we also have to face the reality that says, well, look, guys, we've been killing all these many years. Okay? Can we reconcile? And if the answer is yes, then we ask ourselves, how? Where do we start? You know, 
Do we have the real people who can step to the plate that can take the, these kind of, uh, and, and spearhead this kind of effort? We think so. And the details can emerge as, as the dialogue is started. And I'm glad that uh, Professor Hiri underscored that one. That this is just the beginning of an honest, straightforward debate. Not sugar glazed one. Not a political one that says, just say what I want to hear or I want to say what you want to hear. It isn't. We want to have an honest discussion about the problems that happen to us and what do we have to do in order to find a solution. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, just a little follow-up um, that we often neglect is also I want to add what my, my brother said about injustice. And also it's a very close cousin or maybe it's twin brother, impunity. Absolutely. Um, Somalia is the only place where you can do anything you want. Uh, and in fact, you'll be rewarded since it's been happening since the 90s up, up, until, up until now. And that is continuing not because uh, we do not want to do anything about it, but because someone is willing to defend a wrong. A wrong has been done on his name or on her name. As long as we are then debating or dancing around the issue of what is done to my fellow Somali, we are only less than 10 million. Let's be honest about it. We cannot afford to kill any more people. We're done. And if we continue this path, I'm sure before we, you know, we die, uh, the name Somali itself will be questionable. We may, maybe we may have, you know, a big oceans and there was some, a group of Somali, people called Somali, used to live here. This is not a, you know, an issue of anything else, but can we save our soul? This is an SOS. Can we save our soul for, from distinction, from, uh, from what have you? And it's, the answer is very simple. All I need to do is just to say, look, I'm apologizing for all the wrong things that had happened. I'm not above, although I didn't cause anything, I was around. But then again, a Somali person has done, and a Somali person has done upon. Someone did the wrong, and someone has been wronged. So unless I myself start and say whether I am part of it or not, I'm here to apologize. I'm here not only to apologize, but in the Quran where they say Toba Nasuha, I mean a, a real repentance. Unless I come up with that, and then each and every one of us and say, first I forgive myself and I forgive others. And forgiveness, after all, is good, is it is actually helping to you, not to other people. So at least to begin that process honestly and understand that because real reconciliation does not come unless <coughs> otherwise you admit and then you repent and then you apologize. Uh, first of all, <coughs> I'm very glad that a group of Somali came together trying to resolve our problem because the way things are going on, we all know it's the wrong direction. I just came from the country uh, for a short trip. I was away for two months or something. So the people are desperate in this kind of situation. So and, uh, I'm hoping and praying that this will succeed. My question to you guys is how can we grow and reach everyone else? Because this is something that's needed. See, the, the same way it happened, the 13 people who stood up for the country. We have to fight for this. This is not going to be an easy thing. But there have to be people who are selfless, who don't want themselves something, but they want a solution for the country. So my question is, say, how can you reach others? And on the, on, not only that, how can we reach the people back home, where there's maybe a radio or some television or somewhere we can reach them as well? Uh, thank you. Very, very important question. Uh, well, the reach out, I think, is already uh, underway, because what, what we're doing today is part of that reach out. Okay. And, 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 and indeed, we did discuss, coincidentally, in, in that meeting that I mentioned earlier in last March, the very same thing that you mentioned. How do we get this message across, uh, aside from just the issue in a, a Bach or a, you know, a press statement or whatever to the rest of the people, but how do you send to the ground a consistent message that really keeps people updated as we progress? And what are the issues that are emerging? Because some of the issues we discussed that we consider are key issues, when this debate continues, we might have other things emerging. That's likely. 
But as long as you have people who meet certain quality, for example, and, and, and the doors are not shut, by the way. This is what we consider it as a movement. And you really need, because we are at a stage in Somalia right now where everybody's needed. You know? Right now, we're divided along religion lines, sectarian, you know, call it that, or other things, political, uh, clan, you name it, economic, you name it. You know? um, but right now, in order to get out of our condition, you need everybody. Okay? You need everybody's input. This is part of the dialogue that Professor Hiri was talking about. Are we going to keep it always in a, in a compact room such as this with few people who might have a media interest and in other uh, activists and what have you? No, we're going to take it to the public eventually, and that's what we really are doing. We do have people who are committed in the country, you know, who are really willing to, to do the groundwork, and some of us to go there as we progress and really uh, lay out a, a comprehensive uh, agenda or a strategy that we think can get us out of the current dependency. Just uh, one, more, one more point. In, in any political system, in any society, there are um, political entrepreneurs. Even everybody, if everybody is silent, there's always someone saying something. Uh, so far, what Red Hebel had done, I, and uh, I, I, I have millions, so I want you to protect my, my money with me. You know, there is people who are speaking in the negative terms. And I've been speaking for so long. Uh, and in, in any political system, the idea is that if you don't say it, someone will say it for you, be it wrong. So the question then is that, our, is our silence helping? After all, when they say, Silence equals death. And bad things happen when good people are silent. Then the question is that, is it time for us selflessly, without seeking any position, all of us to say, look, enough is enough. All I need is a country that I can be proud of. I, can, I want to go back and bask in the, in, the, in the beach. Maybe I need to get some suntan, get fresh fish, whatever it is that I want to do. I want my country back. That's all I'm saying. That's all we are all saying, I, I'm, I'm sure. How can we get our country back? The dialogue has to be opened. People have to talk in an honest way without looking for the sh you know, very short, uh, cheap politics. How many guys have been in that throne, collected millions, where are they today? He may live in foreign country and miserable. So what we do need is a country that I can sit down and eat maybe Ambolo or Alole and be proud of. That's all I need. Uh, which is also related to the uh, uh, the proposal that uh, you were putting forward today, which is the preservation of the of the, in the institution of the parliament. Uh, and I think I see some faces. We have uh, uh, Brother Adol uh, was also in the audience, and Professor Hiri Abdullah Hiri. You guys have some experience in uh, 2012 and how this current parliament was selected. But before we looked into this, have you, the group, looked into other alternatives? Because we know that uh, this formation of uh, regional uh, federal states are in the works. Uh, and other people are proposing uh, proposals like uh, a proportional uh, representation. What is uh, the, that you think that makes impossible to move forward in a in a positive way for the Somali society of the Somali and for the country and to preserve the sovereignty of the Somali um, uh, for the this new proposal and how is that different from others that uh, other proposals are out there? Thank you. Uh, I just want to <coughs> kind of uh, clarify something. We did repeatedly said uh, the preservation of uh, institutions, and we did talk about specifically uh, the institution of the parliament, okay? What we're not by any stretch of the imagination suggesting here that the parliament should be granted at uh, any particular extension without passing a litmus test. And the litmus test is clear. 
the commissions that they are supposed to be establishing, all of these things. So it is in, in a conditional one, basically. The parliament has to prove itself that as an institution, it is capable of earning that confidence, even from this particular group. You know, they have to establish that. And what is the key components in there? You have the Reconciliation Commission, which has not been established. We know the judicial and, and, and establishing the constitutional court, which is really essential. You know, how can you, we had a situation in, in recent past, as you all recall, when the presidents, and in a couple of occasions, at least very recently, because we are on the third prime minister right now with this administration alone, right? That kind of contention, each one, each one, each party is contending their own standing on a constitutional ground. Some of us argued in the past and said that the constitution was contradictory in so many different ways, and it is. And the proof of that is what happened. And there wasn't any constitutional court to intervene in those kind of interpretations. But the parliament, with all its shortcomings, with all its corruption, at least one can say they have prevented what could have been a civil war, you know, and a reigniting, re you know, clan contention and all of that. Because in the past, if you're not going to have a political agreement, what used to happen? your enemies, and each person is firing at the other person. Well, that's not happening right now, at least. So there is a level of maturity in that. But I want to underscore that the parliament is not going to be granted something that they did not work hard for it. And that litmus test is going to be proven by the passing of these commissions. We want to underscore that. If they did that, then certainly they would have certain legitimacy over all of them. Because after all, with all its shortcomings and the 4.5 that it's based, which all of us disagree on, and I know some of you, many of you in the audience are very adamantly against that, you know, it's still, it's a representative of every clan in Somalia. Plurality. Yeah. The plurality aspect of it is one of the advantages that it has over all other institutions. So if we really have a conditional uh, litmus test, or if you will, that the parliament passes through and then we grant them that and say you get us out of that and we want to reconcile because without reconciliation really there's no way that you can force people or on, you know, to come in partnership and sign a social contract. They don't do that. That's not how people work. And we have the evidence of that. We've been trying, we wanted to swim against history, you know, and kind of uh, uh, pave our own little world where things work the opposite of what history has proven over the years. But we discover it, nevertheless, that it's not going to work until people are brought together. And, and that's what Professor Hiro, Hiri was saying. None of us, you know, those who were in the leadership dared to come and just say whatever happened, whatever role I had in there, I'm sorry. I'm a different person now. None of them. How do you trust one another then into partnership? Because politics is about partnership and a deadly one at that in many cases. You know, are people going to trust one, one another in that sense? Of course they're not. So there has to be, regardless of people who see it from clan dimension or what have you, that's not the intention. The intention is how you bring people together. And there has to be some level of saying what has been done was wrong. And we take the collective responsibility. I, for one, I'll raise my hand and just say I'm sorry to anyone that directly or indirectly that I have contributed to their misery or injustice, you know. And if every Somali leader stood up and just said that, that will really build some kind of confidence. We don't have a single one in the leadership. Not a single one that I'm aware of. Correct me if I'm wrong. You in the audience know a lot more than I do. You know? And that's what mm -hmm. Professor Hiri was talking about. Thank you. Well, just, just to add, you've, you've talked, we've repeated this word called sovereignty. In the definition of, of, of it and its manifestation are two different things. No country is completely sovereign. Every country is, every, is in every other country's affairs, looking for their own <coughs> interest. It's all about competing interests in the whole international structure. 
The only question is then, with all these competing interests, whether it's your next door or ocean is far, is how do you also get your interests within these competing interests? Today, we are, and, and, and by the way, negotiations or, or, or diplomacy or, 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 or for that matter, is about power. How much power you have is directly correlated where you sit on the table. We are not even in the room, let alone the table. Can we have the tenacity, the ability, the capability to understand that and work, push ourselves at least to come into the room, even if we sit on the floor? And that, my, my brothers and sisters, takes an honest debate, an, an, a, a dialogue, even what, we're, what we are proposing you know, at the end of the day, after, after a genuine and a much larger talk, we may even come up with a different formula down the line. But this is a start, like I said earlier. And if it goes on, it may even change into different things. Yes, the parliament is, 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 is incapable. But then again, this is the only thing plural that we do have uh, uh, and, and to get away from you know, go, you know, going back to what you call a uh, uh, dictatorship that we have seen in the past. So, so again, let us just look at it as a dialogue, an honest opening dialogue that we are just putting on the table. Any other questions? Um, one last one. Um, thank you very much, first and foremost, um, for this beautiful event. Uh, I should say the, the press conference. Um, my question here is, I have read and heard on many different uh, avenues that 26, Division 2016 was alternative. How are we going to get an election? But I have yet to hear anyone saying that, uh, no, we, we, I mean, we are all saying we have to protect our sovereignty and our unity and territorial integrity. Unless we forfeit Somalia, I have not seen anywhere on Vision 2016 or any other options that mentions we need to bring those people back for the unity of Somalia in order to get a transparent and accountable process to move forward. And reconciliation would be one of the steps to, to go through that. What is the plan for government in, in order to achieve um, some sort of uh, a process to preserve the unity of the nation. I, you know, very, very good and uh, timely question. I don't know it has an, uh, if it has an easy answer. This is part of what needs to be negotiated and really be open, uh, to have an open debate on it. Currently, as we are aware, that there is a dialogue supposedly going on between uh, two entities in, uh, that never had an, uh, a conflict of, of its own. Let's be fair about that. Which means right now the two entities that are termed as Somalia and Somaliland. Okay? The two entities never went to war together. They did not. So nevertheless, there is a goodwill effort that was started by our, uh, the Turkish uh, people who are facilitating dialogue between the two entities. Okay. That is a good effort, but I think what the country would need is much broader uh, discussion on the issue of reconciliation. Uh, because reconciliation that we are really discussing right now is not few representatives to go into room and really sign this deal or that deal. That could really pave the way, but that's not what Somalia, you know, at the end of the day, if the two entities signed something, for example, would it commit every little fractured part of the nation into that deal? Let's be honest with one another. Let's just say today there was a deal, okay? And the two entities signed on a paper, the dotted line that says, we agreed on A, B, C, and D. Would that commit every little fractured piece of that land with its own president you know, to respect that. Maybe I'm wrong, but the answer is no. It would not. So we're on a square one, would we not? You know, 
then you would have probably another entity without singling out one who would say, well, why not? If I just claim that I succeeded, maybe I'll get the same privilege again, or, or what have you. It gets you into a mess if you really, uh, how do you say, pigeonhole the process of, of reconciliation. You cannot do that. There has to be, whether it is a something symbolic, that people that Somali led, that they really go and, and reach out to people. And it starts with the open confession that mistakes have happened. And we're not talking about the transitional justice. That's a different story. We can go on, on and on with that. Because if somebody owned the property and his property, somebody else has it, that's individual. Courts can handle those kind of things. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about in the grand scale of things, there has to be a level of reach out that says, I'm, you know, mistakes happen. And we are where we are right now because of the fact that you and I cannot trust one another. What would it take to earn your trust back? What they call um, confidence building, for example. You know, there could be a period where people are really exercising goodwill towards one another to kind of build that confidence. Is that happening right now? No. We have some foreign elements, and let's be frank with it, because uh, with all due respect, this is not Gurma's position. This is my own personal thing, because I did say that. At least one of the people, one of the um, elements, is in fact, has in fact supported each and every Somali group against the others. Let me repeat that. One of the foreign elements okay, has in the past, in the last 24, 25 years, or what have you, supported each of the entity against the other people. So now, each one is loyal to the person who supported against his own. Somebody asked me recently, and they said, why are we humiliated? Why do we accept humiliation, you know, as Somalis? Well, when you're thinking in the clan mentality, you'd rather somebody else humiliate you as long as you're winning against your own brother and look like, mashallah, you know, I look decent. That's the reality. Let's be honest about it. Because the whole world is seeing us after a quarter of a century of war. This is the reality facing us. Let's be honest. So now the question is, how do we get out of that? That humiliation, that sense of dependency. Well, it would take for you to earn the other person's trust. And it starts by saying, I'm sorry about what happened. I'm sorry it took me long. Oh, um, just, just uh, first of all, I mean, um, I do live in Somali land as well. I don't live in the sky. I just don't like that word. It is a former British Somali land, and I live in former Italian Somali land. Uh, be, be that as may, uh, if we cannot even have an honest dialogue or even stability in Mogadishu, the capital city of Somalia, or Galkayo, or Kismayo or Marka. Why would we even worry about at this moment, no, uh, former British Somali land? Former British, if I am former British Somali land, I would have tried to run as far away as I could, given the current situation. This is real politic. Real politic tells you that don't go into a burning home. The ball is on our court, and also in their court or in, any, in anybody's court. I went to Hergis, I've been in Hergis a couple of times. I've never, I haven't even felt different. As if I, you know, I was happy, I was hearing Adan, I was eating the, the most delicious watermelon, although it was very expensive. All of these things put together here is just a, another Somali territory. But how are we defining what is Somali unity? Is Somali unity Mogadishu? Somali unity Mogadishu and Kismayo, Somali unity Mogadishu and Galkayo. How do we define this? This in itself has to be part of our dialogue. What do we mean by Somali unity? We have reached brother against brother. We have reached cousin against cousin. And we still do not have the capability or the tenacity to say, hey, we have wronged each other. How can we put whatever that we have done behind and move on? Um, and final thing, by the way, uh, why our, our foreign entities are succeeding, we have, we have to understand that politics is a two-way mirror. A person can only, or a foreign entity will only treat you 
the way you treat yourself. If you respect yourself and hold your brother and say, this is my brother, a foreign entity cannot come in. But if you say, give me a weapon so I can kill my brother, of course I'll give you 200 guns. And then if he goes to the, through the window, he will give him another 400 weapons. The issue is that our mentality of divide and, uh, and, uh, and uh, eat, eat your brother before anybody else eats <coughs> is at the core of the problem, the lack of the dialogue, the lack of forgiveness, the lack of, of saying, hey, whatever harm that is done to my brother is also done to me. As long as we are really dancing around that, foreign entity will come, anybody else will come, and of course uh, our brothers in former British Somaliland will run away as far as they can, and I don't blame them. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, coming uh, this uh, Friday afternoon, your, uh, sparing your precious times. We really enjoyed, and this is exactly what we had hoped out of this gathering, to have really uh, information, uh, uh, a lot of questions and answers. Thank you very much. I also want to follow my brother. We thank you very much for your time and for your uh, lending your ears to us, and I hope the dialogue continues. <laughs>